Uh, it's good to see each of you tonight. You're in for a real treat. Uh, our uh, speaker has got a long resume. I'm going to read this to you. So, David Nekrutman is a columnist for the Jerusalem Post-Christian Edition, a radio personality from Front Page Jerusalem. He currently serves as the Executive Director for the Center for Jewish-Christian Understanding and Cooperation. Say that five times fast. Uh, in Ephrat, Israel, which is right next to Bethlehem. Bethlehem Ephrata. Uh, in this capacity, uh, David is breaking new ground in leading the first ever Orthodox Jewish institution to dialogue with Christians on a religious and theological basis. Prior to his work with CJCUC, he served as the Director of Christian Affairs for the Consulate General of Israel in New York. He was instrumental in the successful launching of the Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem, the Israel Experience, the Christian Jerusalem Day Banquet, and the Watchmen on the Wall program. Uh, prior to his calling in the field of Jewish-Christian relations, uh, David's professional career ranged from working for the City Council of New York as a legislative analyst to e-marketing for a major high-tech company in Israel. He received a Bachelor of Arts in Forensic Psychology from John Jay College of Criminal Justice. That ought to make some of us a little afraid. And a Master's in Social Work from the University of Pennsylvania. He resides in Netanya with his wife and three sons. Also, too, David is the first ever Orthodox Jewish professional wrestler. Did you know that? <laughs> Not really. Uh, the last thing is um, I've gotten to know David over my trips to Israel and on the phone, and, and I really regard him as a friend, and I appreciate what he's trying to do. Uh, it's very radical what he is attempting to do by extending out of the Jewish community to dialogue with Christians. So he's going to be talking to us tonight about uh, how Jews approach uh, the Hebrew Bible and how they uh, look at the world and, and uh, answering some of your questions. So um, the format tonight's going to work. He's going to kind of teach for a while. You can ask questions if you want uh, that have to do with kind of what he's teaching. And then at the end, we're going to kind of have a general question and answer period that you're welcome to do that. Uh, I think everything you've always wanted to ask a Jew, but we're afraid to ask, is what he said. So, uh, so anyway, please put your hands together and welcome Mr. David McCrutman. Thank you. So it's Saturday morning, and the covers slowly come off from the couple's head. The wife gets out of bed and is getting ready for synagogue services. She tells her husband, it's time to get up, 9 o'clock are services, we only have a half hour to get ready. And the husband is complaining and saying, you know, I just don't feel like going to synagogue today. I just, I, I feel no connection with the people and I'm, not, I'm just not getting anything from, from the service. She says, don't worry, don't worry, Harold, everything is going to be okay. We just, we, we need to go. You got to get ready because it's 27 minutes left to get to, to the synagogue. And he says, you know, I don't know about the message anymore. It seems like, you know, I, it's not connecting and I'm not, I'm not getting anywhere with it. Harold, don't worry about it. We have 25 minutes left to get ready. We need to get going. He puts the covers on his head. And the wife gently approaches her husband, takes off the covers puts her hand on her husband's face, says, Harold, you're the rabbi. You need to get ready. <laughs> Good evening, I'm David Nekrutman. I'm the executive director for the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation. Uh, Adam, really thank you very much for making this happen and all the staff involved in making sure I am fed really well Apparently, I'm invited back next week because Pastor, the other guy, uh, <laughs> wants food on a weekly basis. <laughs> so we'll make these trips a little long, you know, every, every week. Um, I want to start off with basically a quick little teaser. What you have in front of you is the Hebrew, uh, thus Hebrew Bible. And uh, we're going to say, instead of Hebrew Bible, we're going to say Tanakh as a proper word for describing what you would say the Old Testament. I, and I'm not gonna use Hebrew Bible, I'm gonna use Tanakh, which means the five books of Moses, the prophetic writings, 
and the writings themselves, okay? So we're going to call that uh, Tanakh, and we're going to call the New Testament, not New Testament, we're going to call the Apostolic Teachings, okay? This is, when you're doing Jewish-Christian relations, communication is everything, words are everything in order to have a proper communication. So I, I'm not going to say Hebrew Bible, Christian Bible, that's sort of offensive for Christians because saying the Hebrew Bible is not part of the Christian Bible is the, indeed offensive on, on the Christian side. So we're going to do Tanakh and Apostolic Teachings, okay? So the Tanakh obviously was written in Hebrew um, and not in your English translations that you have today. And this is, sort of, this is part of the Hebrew alphabet. I transliterated these words for you here and then I actually translated them. So this is what you have here. So just to give you sort of a, what you're getting involved in tonight is sort of an understanding of how we look at scripture by also highlighting how you also look at scripture as well. So when man was, when a human being was created in Genesis, it was not called a man until woman was fashioned. Okay? A man was called in Hebrew Adam. You call that Adam. Adam for us means Adama, the person was created from the earth, and therefore is named Adam. Very simple, because the person comes from the earth. He only becomes a man when woman is finally fashioned, and now you have two of these beings together, and working towards the glorified God. So man in Hebrew is Ish. A woman is called Isha. If you actually look at these letters, you will see there are two common letters between man and woman. These two, okay? You don't, know how, you don't have to know Hebrew. Just look at the symbols. Look at them as symbols. They're common symbols. That word, Ish, is fire, okay? The uncommon letters, the uncommon symbols you see today is the Yud and He, which is Yah, which is God. Only at marriage, we believe, as both Jews and Christians, is a covenantal partnership. But it only be, you only become a man and a woman once God is involved in the process. Thus, the yud and the he. When you take out God from the process, you are only left with ish, with fire. The marriage is consumed. So simply from the letters themselves, we can learn an important lesson about making sure marriage always has God in it. And it's not about ourselves, it's about going ahead and doing the, th the purposes of what God wants from us. So far so good, any questions on that? This is your little teaser. Everyone is in process mode right now. Do not be afraid, I will not be doing an altar calling tonight. <laughs> so, I started off in Jewish Christian relations about 13 years ago. I had no idea about anything about Christianity. Not a clue. I grew up in the, what's called the yeshiva world, the uh, Jewish parochially world with a black hat and a little long silocks than I have today. And I grew up with uh, that the church is not something that we want to deal with as a Jewish people. And walking into a church would be a violation of idol worship. That's how I grew up. A lot of negative prejudice against Christianity, so actually being here was not on my radar screen. And the only reason why I'm here is because of God. He has a big sense of humor. So I just wanted to be a Jewish Al Pacino, but apparently God had other plans. <laughs> so um, how it all started is because I worked in the City Council of New York uh, during the Giuliani administration. I'm sorry that I'm from New York and I'll sound like I am a typical New Yorker, I'm a little tired right now, so the bagel and the locks and the coffee will start coming out. Um, so I, I, I worked in the Giuliani administration, and I was a political affairs person, and the Israeli consulate was looking for somebody for Campaign 2000 to advise them who they needed to work with in, in, in the state, in the city, and the federal legislation for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. I'm a first generation American, I made Aliyah to Israel eight years ago. I'm a dual citizen. Uh, but at that particular time, I was in, in my New York mode, and uh, really this was, a, again, a sort of divine providence moment. I was at a, at a wedding. Someone I knew during my college days asked if I would be interested in working for the Israeli consulate in New York, and I said, wow, as a Jew to work for the state of Israel in my hometown, this is great. So I get hired, and I'm supposed to be a political affairs person for the Consul General and a Latino affairs liaison for the Deputy Consul General who spoke Spanish. And I knew all the elected officials within the uh, 
in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, and, and, and who spoke Spanish and was dealing with Spanish-speaking communities there. The intifada broke out. When we talk about intifada, that means the sec this particular intifada number two is when, when the, there was a Palestinian uprising to try to end the occupation in the, and, in the West Bank and, and uh, in the Gaza Strip and go back to what they call 1967 borders. Uh, and this was thing happened for quite some time, for many years, from 2000 at least to 2005. I, on the Israeli side, wrote all the obituaries of those who were killed on the Israeli side. That's one of my things I was doing for the Israeli consulate, but I also was uh, briefing the elected officials what was happening behind the scenes. And uh, I was able to get one, uh, the deputy consul general on Telemundo television, and a Brooklyn Spanish-speaking pastor got a calling from God to do a night to celebrate Israel and invited my boss. In March of 2000, it was in March of 2001, this happened, March of 2001. And what's interesting about that is that I'm, I'm, my boss calls me up right before the Sabbath and says, something came up, I have to go to do some media, can you go instead of me to the, to the church gathering? And I'm stuck, I have the voice that says, please your boss, please your boss. I have the other voice say, do you know what you learned when you were a kid? So I gave in to this. <laughs> and I said, sure, no problem. And then the guilty feelings descended upon my shoulders and I needed to find 1-800, find a Jewish legal loophole to go to church. <laughs> I call up my pulpit rabbi and he says, sure, you can go. No problems, no questions asked. Right now we're, we're in a war and you were given a commandment to go. You have to go. I said, thank you very much for the dispensation, Rabbi. I will be going to church tonight for the first time in my life. I walk in. Now, I'm thinking of what I saw in Hollywood movies. I'm thinking of the stained glass windows and Jesus on, on a cross and all these medieval pictures, and I'm walking in, and suddenly it's similar to a room like this, very big. All these Spanish-speaking people going ahead and carrying Israeli flags, singing Israeli songs, and I have my Twilight Zone moment. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> Where did you come from? Am I living? <laughs> What's going on here? And that was, but I was really impressed. It was more love than I got from my own Jewish brothers and sisters. We didn't have any support for the first six months when the Intifada broke out. And I was like, okay, but I'm here just to represent the government, to give the government line. That is it. Monday morning, I go back to work, and I, I do what I need to do. I'm, I am uh, you know, the head for, the, for Israel Line, which is the daily news publication for the Israeli government. And apparently, I did something very successful at the event, which I didn't know what I did. Monday morning comes around. The consul general brings me into his office and says, David, you are now in charge of Christian affairs. So let me get this straight. It's my first time in a church. I have no, no idea about anything about Christianity. Simply because I wear a kippah on my head, I am now given the charge of Christian affairs. This is the reason why Israel's foreign policy is really screwed up. <laughs> so uh, I, I said in, uh, in Jewish terms, I needed to think about it. And in Christian terms, I needed to pray about it. <laughs> and... I go back to my rabbi, and I say, what should I do? He's, and then he reveals to me that he was involved in Jewish-Christian relations for 25 years. Never knew that about my rabbi. And he says to me, you have a sacred responsibility in front of you. Obviously, you can do this from a media perspective and get the Israel side of the story in the Christian media, or you could do this from a faith perspective that we both believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we share a common scripture that we believe is inspired by God. And we believe in that ultimate moment that the world will acknowledge who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is. We must do this from covenant theology, and I hope you would see that. And I have no idea what my rabbi is talking about. I didn't know, understand this whole covenant thing and how you were involved in this whole thing. And I'm a deer in headlights. Very simple. I said, Rabbi, if you think I should do it, I'll do it. 
And I go back to my boss, and I said, I'll do, the, I'll do the portfolio on three conditions. Number one, I need to learn about Christianity. I think it's wrong to enter into a relationship without knowing who you are. And I can't assume things. Number two, I parrot everything about what my rabbi said in saying that we needed to do this from a, a religious portfolio or perspective. And number three, I need my rabbi aboard. And the consul general agreed on one condition, that I would write a white paper in every single denomination within Christianity, their political and theological stance on Israel, and had six months to complete it. <laughs> now, I love this moment because I thought this was going to be easy because you're all Catholic. <laughs> now, you have to understand, I'm from New York. I border a neighborhood with the Italians, and there's a Catholic church in every single block. So apparently you're all Catholic. I didn't know about this whole Protestant Reformation. It was not in my Jewish studies in 10th grade. It wasn't. I didn't know. I didn't know anything. So lo and behold, wow, did I discover things. You have a lot of movements. Obviously, I'm in a Methodist church, but you know, there are Lutherans and Episcopalians and, you know, oh, wait, Baptists. Right? There's the northern and the southern. There's 150 independents. And then the evangelical world. Wow. And I said after doing research, I said, boy, you guys need a pope and everything will be fine. <laughs> oh, that's the problem. That's the whole point of the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> okay. See, in Jew, in, Jews love to go ahead and organize things by, by committee. We love to do that. We, that's how the camel was actually created, was through a Jewish committee. Um... So I didn't expect to be involved in Jewish-Christian relations, uh, but somehow God put me in that situation. And um, after doing this research, I, I came up with the idea that we wanted to do a Christian prayer service in the Israeli consulate, which would be the first time ever doing something like that. When you're in the Israeli consulate, you're on Israeli soil, even though you're in the United States. And uh, we had the first prayer service in 2001, and I have to say, it was a very unbelievable event. I met somebody who, who became a dear friend. His name was Robert Stearns. And through that relationship, I saw an anointing in his life, something that we don't use that word anointing in, in Judaism. But I learned that Christianese term, anointing. When I first heard about it, I thought my head and shoulder shampoo wasn't working this morning. <laughs> uh, but I found out he, had, he really truly had an anointing in his life. And through that, as, as uh, Adam pointed out, uh, we created something called the Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem on the first Sunday of every October. Uh, churches around the world pray for Israel. It's not a political event. It's just simply prayer for peace for Israel, which we desperately want and seek. Through that, um, eventually I moved to Israel with my wife and then two sons. I have three sons now. And uh, I never thought I would get back into Jewish-Christian relations. And lo and behold, in November of 2007, Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, who's the chief rabbi of Efrat, and when we talk about Efrat, I'm talking about where Boaz and Ruth consummated their union. This is the backyard of King David. This is where Mother Rachel is buried. This is Micah 5.2, from, from Bethlehem Efrat, the small clan of Judah. So, never thought I'd get back, and then I get a call from the chief rabbi of Efrat. He says, I just got off the phone with a pastor friend of mine, Robert Stearns. He says, you should be my executive director for my Center for Jewish Christian Understanding that I wish to open up. Meet me at Ben Gurion Airport tonight at 11 o'clock. Honey, I'll be home a little late. <laughs> I meet with Rabbi Riskin, and he tells me of his vision that he was influenced by the Sisters of Canaan, a Lutheran order in Darmstadt, Germany, that their whole reason for their order is to atone for their father's participation in, as SS officers during, during, during the Second World War. And they came to Efrat when, when nobody really was coming to Israel, and they comforted the, the city of Efrat. And that had a tremendous impact on him, as well as other Christians coming in and comforting the, the city of Efrat and the Jewish people. It was just like he said, if there's this new type of Christian which we never interface with beforehand, what is, our what is our response going to be? And the response is the opening of the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding. It is based upon that we both share in this covenantal experience within the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
And since the church and synagogue really have not really had this discussion of what is in common with, with, uh, with us and discussing what is not in common with us, it's hard to understand who you are and it's also hard to understand us from your perspective. So the purpose is, is to create positive communication between two faith communities that for almost 2,000 years have been sort of bitter enemies. And that's the role of what the center does today. And we do this using the Bible because that is what binds us. The word of God, it is our communion in essence and our revelation and our interpretation and how we see things. So it's very possible that we can look at a scriptural verse, same one, and have two different conclusions. And the question is how does that happen? And through that experience, how can we go ahead and learn from each other? So this is what, we're, what I'm trying to do tonight is create positive communication between our two faith communities. Wherever you are in your Israel journey, or whether or not Israel is on your radar screen even to begin with, I'm here as a person to extend a hand of friendship and saying we want to walk together with you. Okay? And I'm coming from the land where Jesus was born, Ephrat, Bethlehem Ephrat. So we do this through the Bible, and we're going to talk about the concept of amen. I assume you use amen in your worship service. All right? Okay, so I'm going to show you amen in Hebrew for a second. It's three letters in Hebrew. I'm just going to put this out, and I'm going to put this. The question comes up is, we're so used to the word of amen, where is it in the Bible? How did it come to be in our worship service today? I know you take it for granted. You think it's just part of who we are, but what we're going to show you tonight is that it might have never entered into our worship service to begin with. So I'm going to start from the apostolic teachings first. This is where you're going to need your Bible. My understanding is already in front of you. And we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 16. First of all, I want to know if you have the word amen in your translation, in that verse, you do. Okay, I just want to point out, not every single English Bible will have the word amen, but it's very good to know that amen is in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 16. How many people are in this verse? How many people are in this verse? This is called an interactive session. Audience participation is encouraged. Two people are in this verse. There's somebody who is blessing and somebody who's responding with the word amen. Okay. So the person who's responding amen does not know how to bless. Does that make, make sense? If you look at the verse. So there's something liturgical happening in this verse. It's very important because it's not just spontaneous prayer. If it was, there's no reason to say amen. I can spontaneous prayer, you can do it, but obviously in this particular case, there is a particular blessing happening that is liturgically there, but the person who's responding amen does not know how to do it. And the way he fulfills that prayer obligation is by responding with amen. So amen, in essence, is sort of like a legal agreement. It fulfills a prayer obligation that's happening in that verse. I want to just make sure you understand that before we continue. What we see, if we fast forward, another category within the apostolic teachings is in the book of Revelation. Chapter 3, verse 14. I know it's strange as an Orthodox Jew that I'm quoting from the apostolic teachings, but this is what we do in Jewish-Christian relations in order to go ahead and make a Bible session happen. I have to come from where you are and how you interpret the Bible in order for you to understand how we're going to go ahead and add into that. Does that make sense? Okay. So the book of Revelations will then transform amen to a second category, which is what? It's okay, you can say it. We are in a church sailing. <laughs> Who's amen? Specifically? Jesus, okay? With thus the capital W in the verse, okay? It's not just God, it's specifically Jesus. So what happened in the apostolic teachings 
as a category. We had a category of, of a legal prayer obligation that transformed to Jesus himself. So far, so good? Now the question comes up in the Tanakh. He, amen, was introduced in the book of Numbers, chapter 5. I think it's uh, verse 22, where you'll see um, amen, right? Let me give you a context before, before we get into specifically this amen and how it functions. To, in order to get a biblical death penalty, you would need two witnesses to actually see someone committing the act. It's very important that you know that. You need two witnesses for testimony. So in order for this, someone to get a biblical death penalty, I first have to see something happening. So let's, let's talk about the case of adultery because this is what this is about. We see a couple going into a hotel room. But this couple are not married to one another. They're actually married to other people. So if we're talking about biblical days and Adam and I are going ahead and about to, we're in the, we see in the inn in those days going into a hotel room, I would have to first, we first have to warn the couple of what they're doing. Listen, if you're doing this, it's against God and the death penalty is part of the thing. You don't really want to do this. And the couple says we're in love. Sorry, Adam and David, I really don't care. We actually see them commit the act because if we don't see them commit the act, we can't testify that they actually violated the act. So we actually have to see the act and then go to testify to the court. Then, because it's a, it's a death penalty case, we have 23 judges that have to go ahead and reside over this decision of whether or not the couple who allegedly, at this particular point in time, committed an adultery to actually go through this process. We then are separated into two different rooms. The judges will go through his testimony. They will go through my testimony. And then they have to have a majority of agreeing that whether or not the couple is going to get a death penalty or not. That's how you get a death penalty punishment from, from a Jewish perspective, okay? But it's all based upon biblical scripture. What happens if you don't have the witnesses, but the husband is a little suspicious of his wife's nightly activities? This is where we are in Numbers chapter five, verse 22. The husband is suspicious. He wants justice. She gets a cup of water with some dirt in it. The priest then says, listen, if you are guilty, you're gonna go through a horrible death. If you're innocent, nothing is going to happen. She responds, amen, how many times? Oh, so you have amen, so be it. Actually, it's a double amen. It's not amen, so be it. And this is the reason why you would think amen means so be it. But it doesn't, in Hebrew, it's really amen said twice. Amen for the negative and amen for the, for the positive. Does that make sense? Okay? Translations are always going to have so, someone's subjectivity into a verse. It's just a fact. Okay? So I always go back to the original source. Even when you're dealing with the apostolic teachings, you should go back, back to the original Greek. Okay? So Numbers chapter five is very interesting because the first introduction to amen is associated with for adultery. A word that I would not use in a worship service. All right, amen. Hmm. It gets worse. Deuteronomy chapter 27. We have a bunch of Jews hanging out in the Mount of Ebal. And there's a bunch of curses being declared. And after every single curse, there is a amen. Wow, this word is not going, is not really, not a good word. Being associated with every single curse in the book and adultery. So it wouldn't make sense that we would not use this word in a worship service. So we have to find out in the, in the Tanakh whether or not amen is used in any positive direction. I'm just curious, do you have a, a tradition in, in Deuteronomy chapter 27 that Jews are also hanging out on a different mountain about the blessings and there was an amen after that? I'm just curious if you have that tradition. No, but 
you might. Some denominations have that tradition. Jews have that tradition. There were two groups of Jews, one on Mount Ebal, one on Mount Grizim. And Mount Grizim had the blessings, and there was an amen there. But in, in Scripture, it doesn't say that. It only talks about the curses. But I was just curious if you ever learned that growing up. No? Nope. Okay. That's fine. So, we go to Chronicles. First uh, Chronicles, chapter 16. 36. First Chronicles, chapter 16, verse 36. It is a joyous occasion, everybody. Guess what's happening? The tabernacle has been inaugurated, and now we're bringing the ark into the tabernacle. And what word is being used to praise God? Amen. Whew, thank God. Something positive about Amen. But the question is, well, maybe amen was only used for a particular event, and we have no license whatsoever to use amen in our worship services today. What gives me the right to use amen outside of what seems to be an unlikely, you know, an event that seems to be unique for its time? So you're going to say, hey, David, don't you know about Psalms? Yes, I do know about Psalms. So we're going to go to... I'm not asking you to actually go to every single psalm here, but we're going to, I'm just going to let you know about the psalms. Psalms 41, 14, 72, 19, 89, 53, and 106, 48. And every single instance, amen is being used, is being used in a praise fashion. So thank God we found places in the Bible that amen is used in a praise fashion. Therefore, wow, now we can have the license to be able to use it in our worship services today. And we don't have to think all about those negative things that were in the first five books of Moses. But the question comes up is what is the, how do we know that we actually have a biblical mandate to actually say amen in a worship service? Even though amen is being used, is it an obligation to actually be used as opposed to a suggestion or a recommendation? So we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 3. And over there it says, For when I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness unto our God. When I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. So this is called an inference, a biblical inference. Both Judaism and Christianity believe in biblical inferences. It doesn't say, thou shall say amen after a blessing. Or when you are worshiping God, you shall say amen. It's not like, you know, written out in the Ten Commandments style. It's inferred from the Bible. And when I ascribe greatness, ascribe is when when I'm proclaiming the name of the Lord. Since we believe in taking text within context, and a word that keeps being popped up in praise and worship is amen, therefore, this is our biblical source of mandating somebody to use amen in a praise and worship concept. So far, so good? Okay, did I mention any rabbis to you today? No, right? I plagiarized a lot. I did copyright infringement. It's a big no-no in but the reason why I'm doing this is because this is something that you're very used to having within Christianity. Uh, you're talking, using scripture to explain scripture. Often that's the, one of the major ways of going ahead and Christians going ahead and interpreting the Bible. Often Christians hear Jews quoting all different type of rabbis and there's sort of this thing in, like basically shutting down when hearing a rabbi quoting another rabbi because there's a feeling that their doctrines of men is trumpeting the Bible. Something, something that's often felt within Christian circles when a rabbi calls, says Maimonides. And you might not know who Maimonides is. And how does a 13th century rabbi go ahead and make the road for, for interpretation of the Bible? Whether you know who Maimonides is or not, it really doesn't matter. What I want to point out to you is that in Judaism, the reason why we quote others is because there is a concept of copyright infringement. I wasn't joking before. <laughs> copyright infringement is a, very, is a very severe violation. It's actually worse than taking someone's money. Taking someone's knowledge and someone's revelation 
about the word without going ahead and giving proper credit is worse than taking someone's money. Okay? Just like you have a Holy Spirit, we also have a Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit has revealed a certain interpretation of the Bible. So with, this is, you know, again, our communion with the word and understanding the word, we also have a Holy Spirit. It might be a little different than yours, but we do have it to help us interpret the Bible. And thus, if someone has this revelation, then I want to give proper credit. That is the reason why Jews quote rabbis. That makes sense. It's not there to go ahead and trumpet the Bible. It's out there to go ahead and understand the Bible. So the reason why I didn't quote any rabbis is because that sort of becomes the, the uh, non-starter in Jewish-Christian relations because many Christians are coming from a point of view is what does the Bible say? So what I want to point out to you, interpretation, revelation, is the, didn't stop at Sinai. It's always an ever-evolving process when we are dealing with the word. There's always going to be tension in verses and trying to resolve the tension in verses, you're going to have human beings interacting with the word through the spirit to understand what it's all about. So far, so good? Okay. Now I'm going to throw in Jewish interpretation. Up until this point in time, this is a message that you can get in your Alpha Omega classes on a Wednesday night, your Bible classes on a Wednesday night, and this is something that's pretty normal, right? And I came from a very Christian point of view. Now I'm going to throw something very Jewish to you, okay? Okay. Just I remember I pointed out at the beginning about the importance of the Hebrew letters in trying to understand what God wants from us. I'm going to do the same thing again here. Amen is usually translated as so be it or I agree. Okay? Those who are thinking, no, I don't believe it's so be it, I agree. Those are usually the typical translations, right? Amen for Jews never meant that. Amen is a three-letter Acronym. Okay? It's not, it's not a word. It's an acronym for us. Okay? And I'm going to point this out to you. The Aleph represents El, which is God. The Mem is Melech, which is King. And the Nun is Ne'eman, which means faithfulness. No one went, ah, okay. <laughs> Faithfulness, yes, am I? So when we say amen, we're actually saying God, king, who is faithful. It's a declaration. We don't just believe in a God. We believe in a particular God. A God that is a covenantal God, God that is a faithful God. When God introduces himself at the Sinai Revelation, he doesn't say, hey, I'm the God who created the world, guys. Listen up. No, he doesn't do that. He says, I am that God who took you out from Egypt. I am that God who made this covenant with Abraham, said specifically that the descendants of Abraham would go through a major horrific episode in their lifetime, namely the Egyptian slavery, but I will bring them out from there and bring them to the promised land. Did it actually happen? Yes. That's a faithful God. It's a personal God. It's a redemptive God. It's not just any God. It's not like I'm hanging out with Buddha and I'm enjoying, hey, one of the gods. And so I'm hanging out with God who is a faithful God who I can trust 100% to carry forth his word. Otherwise, if we don't believe that, we're in serious trouble. So when we're saying amen, it is a... A declarative is a declaration that we are affirming God who is faithful. This is very important because when you go to the apostolic teachings and you actually see this custom of someone responding amen to a blessing, it's two people involved in the process because why should I say anything at all? When someone's blessing and I just want to go along with the program, can I not just go ahead and do this? I gotta say something, why? Because two are witnesses. Two are coming together and declaring who God is. Even though one is sufficient, but we know that one is not, does not, is not sufficient for testimony. 
If one sees something happening and testifies in the court, it's true, but we can't do anything about it because we need to. And therefore, in the blessings and in worship, there's a partnership happening, and we're declaring God's faithfulness. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Yep. I'll repeat the question. So your question is when someone has this revelational moment, writes it down, has this interpretation about the Bible, if it's going from it's succeeding from one generation to the next generation, are we not afraid that people will add to it? And therefore, maybe you get too far away from the original message. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Just like there's a church tradition here in the Methodist, there is tradition, right? People have given over their interpretations and people have looked into someone's insight and added to that. Th- thus called commentary, right? So the answer is yes. But the thing is, is we, if we know the original source, then we can go back and see whether or not someone moved away from the original message. That's the beautiful thing about copyright. I can go back to the original source. This is why it's very important that we actually quote somebody and put it down because things get convoluted along the way. If you're just relying on someone's personal interpretation, writing it down, then putting it into a book and hopefully someone, yes, so 100%. Okay? But doesn't take away that person's revelation at that particular point in time to help us understand what God wants from us. Okay? Any other questions about this teaching? I'm not doing how to... Uh, that you were afraid to ask any question about a Jew, now you can ask, and we're gonna do that later on. I just wanna go through this, yes. If I'm praying by myself, should I not bother saying amen because I'm not a witness, so this doesn't have a meaning? A hundred percent. If you're praying, for, so this is where we have Jewish law. If I am praying by myself, do I say amen to my own blessing? The answer is no. I can't say amen. Amen is used as only a legal, as a legal thing in prayer obligation. As I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be obligated in prayer. If I don't know how to pray, or I want to be part of this prayer, then I have to say amen. But you never say amen to your own blessing. So yes, from a Jewish point of view, we don't say amen to our own blessing. How do you know? How do you know? How do you know that God, you're finished with God? So the thing is, I would, I would just say to you, by simply not, continuing in the conversation, God pretty, know, pretty much knows <laughs> on that. Just, I, again, I, it's very interesting, and this was, uh, this was, it was it's actually very funny, it happened yesterday. Prayer is not us to inform God what he doesn't know about, okay? Prayer is about praising who he is. It's first choice, not last chance. Okay? It's about going ahead. Prayer is not a petition. Prayer is an, an instinct for us to acknowledge who God is. So therefore, if we're praising God and we're telling him what we love about God, then once we finish with that, I think pretty much God knows we're finished. So I don't need to say, hey, God, we'll continue this a little bit later after my Starbucks coffee. <laughs> okay? Good? Okay, any other questions before I move on to another lesson? We're good? Okay. So, so what I wanted to show you, just to sort of bring out, is that we use Hebrew letters as part of our interpretation of the Bible, which is something may or you may not have known. But this is what we do, okay? It's called remez in Hebrew. This is the interpretation. Using letters, either through a numerical point of view or using the letters itself to help us with the interpretation. It's called remez. Just like you have something called whatever is hidden in the old is revealed in the new, right? And you look at the Tanakh through apostolic teaching eyes, an interpretation we don't know about in Judaism about you, because we were never, you might not know this, but in our canon we don't have the apostolic teachings. 
And therefore, when you say, whatever is hidden in the old is revealed in the new, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Let us make man in our image. Who's us, from your perspective? Some type of part of the Trinity, right? Why do you say that? Does it say anything about some part of the Trinity in the verse? No. But you know about the verse, I'm the Alpha, I'm the Omega. Or in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became da 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 da, right? All that is in that interpretation of us being something about the Trinity. Does that make sense? If I don't know about that, I am very perplexed in how you see Jesus in the verse. What was well intentioned may not always be well received. It's a basic communication. I intended this to say this, but you mis- misinterpreted what I was trying to say. I th- you're throwing Jesus in the verse from a Jewish point of view. I'm like, whoa, are you trying to convert me? Hold off. I, I got somewhere to go. And I don't want that to happen because it was never your intention to do that. You're just, you know, this is an interpretation you were brought up with, we, but we weren't exposed to that, and therefore, misunderstanding. And, and unfortunately, you know, it can happen that a relationship never gets off the ground because of, what, of a misunderstanding. Oh, great question. So we have two possible interpretations. Number one, if you believe in angels, we do, uh, and the angels were created before the human being, Angels might not like the human being too much. They're the cheerleading squad for God. Yay, God. They praise him every day, right? They're on a mission. They're the James Bond of creation. And they might not be too happy about this human being. And the whole focus of the world is on this human being. And God is making that very clear. I want the human being to acknowledge who I am. Angels, you, need to, you have a job, but we need to do this together because this is, what I, this is my will. So he's conferring with the angels. This is a possible interpretation. Now, the second interpretation is, since Adam, Adam, is created from the earth, God is conferring with his creation because the human being is supposed to rule over the earth. Well, as you can tell today, we haven't been very good stewards of the, protecting the earth. And obviously, the earth may have a problem about having this human being ruling over it and possibly destroying it. And God is saying, listen, it's focus on my creation. I want you to do this with me. So it teaches us that no matter how high you are, you must confer with others. If God did it, then you also have to do it. Can I prove these interpretations from the Bible? No. I want to make that very clear. Jews don't always go according to to what it always says in scripture. We also have something called an oral tradition or an interpretive way of looking at the Bible. Thus tonight, trying to sort of point out how Jews and Christians look at the Bible and using those interpretations in order to go ahead and facilitate a dialogue to better acquaint one with the other, okay? Not saying that your interpretation is wrong. I wanna make that very clear. Well, I'm saying this is how you interpret the Bible and this is how we're gonna interpret the Bible. And sometimes you're going to know, I'm not going to know about your interpretation style, and you're not going to know about our interpretation style. They're just different frame of mind when it comes to the Bible. Is that clear? Yes. Of course we do. But prayer's focus, let me qualify that. She asked is that, do Jews pray for healing and stuff like that if you're looking at it just to praise God? And the answer is, of course we ask God to help us out with healing, but the focus of prayer is not petition. The focus of prayer is praise and acknowledgement, accepting God's kingdom, uh, all that other stuff. Once I do that, then I can move into petition mode. How our, how our liturgical Prayers are set up as first acknowledgement. God, thank you for going ahead and, and making me wake up today. And I want to just praise you for going ahead and making me be able to walk and talk and move and be able to do all my dealings today. And by the way, I'm going to say some psalms about your glory and I love you. You're the best. And then at the end, I'm like, hey, you know, I have an issue. Maybe you can help me out. And I'll, I'm okay if you say no, but I'm just letting you know what my list is. 
Because you are a father that hears. And what you want me to do is acknowledge you and praise you and also to relate to you. That's what prayer is also. But the focus is not, hey, God, listen up. This morning, when I go to work, I want traffic just not to be there. <laughs> I, I, you, know, you know, this line is not good. You know, I just want that guy to have my cafe latte ready for me to go. All right, so I'm gonna, that's sort of the, you know, we often look at prayer as sort of a petition. So I don't, so from a Jewish point of view, that's not what we, what we, we deal with. Any other questions before I continue? Yes. Oh, I have two. Um, yes, the Lord's Prayer is a very Jewish prayer, 100%. The order, the order it is, yes. It is, okay, so, wow. Okay, so let me just sort of give you off. It's based upon what, what's called a Kaddish, but let's just deal. When... When uh, what you call someone passes away in Judaism, uh, we have a specific prayer that we say for those who have who have passed on and are now with God. But the prayer that we we say it has nothing to do about death. Okay, this is the prayer, so you should just know: Magnify and sanctify may His great name be in the world He created by His will. May He establish His kingdom, make His salvation flourish, and hasten His Messiah in your lifetime, and your days, and the lifetime of all the house of Israel, swiftly and soon, and say amen. May his great name be blessed forever and all time. Bless and praise, glorify, exalt, raise, and honor, uplifted Lord, be the name of the Holy One. Blessed be he beyond any blessing, song, praise, consolation, other in this world, and say amen. It has nothing to do about death. It's all about going ahead and accepting God's decision, and then in that process, we glorify God and we praise God. The Lord's Prayer has a similar thing of going ahead and acknowledging who God is, and then you go into sort of that particular mode of petition in the Lord's Prayer. Okay, so yes, the Lord's Prayer is very Jewish. Yes. Okay. Okay, so you're asking, so your question is, is after the whole thing of, of let us make man in our image, the whole thing of the Garden of Eden episode. Okay, so that is a separate question than the lesson that we have today. No, it's okay. It's a good question. I want to be able to address that a little bit later, if that's okay with you. So, okay, is that fine? I just want to stick with the lessons, and then afterwards we can, yeah, so we can deal with that in the, in the Q&A por- portion of it. Is that okay? Okay. Amen. In the prayer that you just read, yes. you said amen a couple of times. So yes, that is, the amen is where the congregation comes in and says amen. So that's corporate prayer? That is corporate prayer, okay? okay. Your personal, do, when you have your personal prayer time, yes. do you pray out of the book? No. Oh, good question. So do Jews have spontaneous prayer? The answer is, I would have to say, unfortunately, we're not trained in spontaneous prayer, which is something that we can learn from Christians and to go ahead and go into spontaneous prayer. We usually rely on liturgical prayer or psalms in order to do that. And there, but uh, I, I would say, unfortunately, yeah, in, in the personal prayer thing, it's always relying on lit- liturgy. The reason why, the reason why for that is because if you're saying to God, God, you're awesome, you're powerful, and you finish, we would say, is that it? <laughs> That's all you have for God? So we're always fearful that we're not doing enough praise. And we want to make sure when you're dealing with God that there is sufficient praise. Thus, liturgy was developed. And help us, it helps us focus on what we need to do. But at the same time, we get so caught up in liturgy, we forget about the imminence of God right here and responding to that. And responding to that. So I'd have to say, in my, in my uh, 13 years in Jewish-Christian relations, I've learned to learn from the Christians how to pray better in my own personal prayer life. There's corporate prayer, that's fine. That I got, we got down. But the personal prayer life, I, I've learned better to be a per, uh, in my own personal prayers from, from Christians and seeing how you pray. Something to be learned, 100%. We're good with amen? Amen. Okay. <laughs> N- 
By the way, so you should just know, my first service was a charismatic, a charismatic Pentecostal service, and like I said something, and someone said, amen, and I was like, whoa. It was just, <laughs> it's a little scary. And then someone said, hallelujah. I'm like, what's going on? And, <laughs> so, because what you're called, we only say amen after our rabbi is finished. We'll do that again. It's a joke. We only say amen after our rabbi is finished. I know that. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're going to deal with the concept of silence in the Bible. A particular story about silence. And we need to go to uh, Leviticus chapter 10. As you just know, this is the um, inauguration of the tabernacle in the desert. There was a week long of festivities taking place. On the eighth day of the dedication, we see in chapter 9, verse 23, just to let you know, Aaron and the nation of Israel offer several sacrifices, and the glory of God appears. Then in chapter 10, something strange happens. The two sons of Aaron do what? Kindle a strange fire. Is that what you have in your Bible? Whatever that strange fire may be is open to interpretation. What happens to these two, two sons? They're killed, right? They're actually burnt from the inside. The fire goes up their nostrils. The whole insides are taken out, and they die. Now, I just want you to understand what happens here. Sort of like dramatize it a bit. You have a nation that was enslaved almost 400 years of persecution. They are redeemed. They see the miracles of what's happening in Egypt and all these plagues, but they're not touched by it. They get out of Egypt. They go through the Red Sea. I mean, like, wow, amazing stuff. And they're in this desert right now, and now finally they have the tabernacle and it's a festivity, and like Aaron, the priest. He's a priest. Of the, he's the first one. He's a leader of his people who, who are now out of slavery and freedom. And his two sons are going to eventually take over the office. And he's seeing his sons in front of him. I mean, the joy a father has. And all of a sudden, in a moment's notice, there's complete devastation. What is Aaron's reaction to this? Silence. So the question is, what is, it, what is this silence? What does it mean? So let, I mean, just, let's do a little exercise. What do you think the silence means? Perfect. Say that again? Acceptance. Acceptance. Anybody else? Huh? Angry? Angry? No, thanking. He's thanking. <laughs> oh, he's thinking. Okay. All right. It's okay, you can say. Anybody else? What was that? Horror, bewilderment. So I'm just, just so he's, uh, he's in awe, in, a, in awe, right? You're going to say horror. Anybody else? Grief. Say that again? Grief. 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 Anybody else? So I want to make sure. Speak now. We believe in Judaism that if you are silent, you agree. Okay? Thus, speak now, forever hold your peace. Okay. So, in Hebrew, silence, in this particular verse, in this particular verse, is called dom in Hebrew. Okay? Dom. Now, if you have a concordance on the Bible, we were trying to find out what was the best way to try to find out what the proper translation of this word dome is we'll go to the concordance and we're gonna find out where this word appears in other places in the Bible. And therefore, I will have my translation. Correct? 
So what I just want you to understand, your first thing is what I think the Bible is saying, and then we have to go ahead and find out if this is indeed what the Bible is saying by going ahead and learning, looking in Scripture. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's find out where this word appears in the Bible. And we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 17. It's very important that you go and actually see it. Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 17. And it says there, anybody want to volunteer? Say that again. Grown quietly. Or silently. Okay, that's interesting. In other translations, it's be silent in mourning the dead. Which is more to the Hebrew. Be silent in mourning the dead. So Ezekiel is, going to, is telling us that this is mourning. That the word dome is mourning. Grieving. Right? Which we had over here. Correct? Open and shut case. Right? Problem. We're going to find a different verse that is going to tell us something else. Okay, we're in, we're in the book of Joshua. Chapter 13, verse 13. Chapter 13, verse 13. And what does the verse say over there? It's a famous verse. Remember about Jericho, what was happening with Jericho? There was a battle going on and you know, Joshua was asking God for something. What was that? The sun. The sun stood still. It uses the Hebrew word dome, and it means still. In this case, sort of in a paralysis mode. Is it mourning? Is it grieving? No, the sun is not grieving. It's just in the paralysis. Okay? Does any of these interpretations that we talked about fit into that paralysis mode? It could be, it could be, well, in this thing, is the sun is not in hara, it could be in awe, okay? Which is the closest one that we have within what we talked about right now. So now we have two possible translations, right? It gets even worse. <laughs> we go to Psalm, um, Psalm 39, 3. Anyone want to tell me what that what the psalmist is saying over there? My heart goes out between you while I meditate. Okay. Okay, so wow, you have a different translation. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace and had no comfort, and my pain was stirred up. Hey, okay, different translation. I'm telling you, translations are different. But here it's about what? Hmm? Oh, it's verse 2? I'm sorry, 39.2? I apologize, and my Bible is 32. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace and had no comfort, and my pain was stirred up. So it's not grief. What is it? It's more of anger, right? So I'm going to add this on. Is anger. Okay. So, we have three possible variations of this word. Last but not least is Psalm 65 2. To you, silence is praise. Someone said before thanking, 
okay? <laughs> or thinking, I heard thinking. But I want to show you that there's different variations of the word. Going from mourning to simply being in a paralysis, like, oh my God, what just happened? State of shock. I would actually use the word shock in here. Anger and then praise. Question is, is what would work going back to Aaron's silence from your, from your perspective? Shock? All of them. In sequence. So this is sort of like a psychoanalysis process. Yeah. I'm going through this, the stages of grief. All right? It's interesting. I just want to show you that the way you're interpreting right now is exactly the process that we do. I wanted you to go through this exercise because this is what we as Jews do, but we, we try to find out what scripture can back us up. But the problem here is we have four different scriptures that can back up any one of us. And we have to make a decision what will work best for the verse. So what a lot of you are saying, what I'm hearing, is that you're combining all of it into it. Okay? For me... I think praise seems to be the most adequate. It is, it is the hardest, actually, of all. That in that moment, you can actually go and praise God. And the, the lesson you can learn from that, I could be wrong. I do have a scripture to back me up. It's important to know that. But this is where your personal plays a part in the interpretation, which we all do. That's okay, that's working with the word of God. Acknowledging that there are other ways to look at it, which is what I wanna show you, the more important lesson is, there's not always sometimes, a, it's not always black and white. There's a variation of interpretations, okay? For me, praise is, is hard. I have kids. To know that, that, that something that tragic can happen before your eyes and you can still find within yourself the ability to praise God is huge because my first initial reaction would be, Really, I would be angry. Truthfully, I would be angry. But, uh, but Aaron is sort of our role model. And I want our biblical forefathers, maybe in my dreamland state, to be a little bit more than me so I can use them as a place for, for example. But that's just my personal take on it. When someone says, what do you think? What does your heart, what does your heart say? This is from my, my perspective. I think praise works the best. The purpose of this exercise was to actually go through what we did and see that there are variations in interpretation. Not always, there's always gonna be one. And that's the beauty of scripture. Is that you can have this array of interpretation to rely on and to seek what, what God wants from us. Any questions on this? See? He remains in the person God has made him to be. Okay, so I want to show you that that translation is a personal decision on the translator. The word is silence, and he was silent. Not that he remained silent, and he was silent. That is the word in Hebrew. He remained silent is a translator's take on the four variations of this that he was so shocked that he remained silent. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. But you're still a father at the same time. You can't take away humanity from the verses. I mean, they were human beings and not all of them were perfect. And therefore, I would, again, this is, a, again, we go back to, I, from my personal point of view, I love the praise part. You can, I get the anger part too, but I'm saying, I'm being, and I'm letting you know that I want, I want my biblical forefathers to be sort of my role model. They can also be my, you know, they're just two guys like, you know, they're just guys like me, that's fine, 
but, for, for, but because I have a scripture to back me up, because I have that, I'm choosing this. Okay, that's my subjectivity. But that's also the subjectivity of the translator as well. That's where commentary comes in. Not the other thing, correct. But it doesn't mean that you know, it's wrong, the other part of it, okay? Any questions on this? Was this helpful so far? Okay. So in the midst of seeing his two sons die before him, as a father, he's, gonna, he's like going along with the program? He's going along with the program and being very accepting of it and also being condemning about his sons. It's possible, but that's pretty rough from my point of view. Perhaps accept With the golden calf specifically, with what? What am I? Oh, so the, what? What? Do, how do I look at Aaron's participation in the whole golden calf story? He was he was wrong. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's, an, it's very, he's wrong. He was wrong. He because because again, in, in Judy, at least from a Jewish perspective, Aaron is the person of peace, and sometimes when you try to placate people too much you lead yourself into a situation where you actually compromise biblical values and what God's will is all about. This is exactly what happened to Aaron. He was placating them so much that he actually was involved in creating an idol. Wrong. Everything is in, you have to take everything that we're doing for, you know, in, in our relationships with people. There's gotta be a boundary where you're not gonna cross over if it's gonna violate what, what God's will is about. And Aaron made a mistake, 100%. So did Moses. He hit a rock, right? So, you know, that's the whole point of the Bible. You have these human characters flawed. We are, where for some reason God decided, hey, these stories are important for you. And you got to figure out what the lessons are. I'm just going to present them. Here it is on, on a civil platter. Now go and figure out what this is all about. If that's helpful. Yes? Is it possible to say that he, he was accepting the will of God? It's very possible. I just don't have a scripture to back it up. And that's okay. You just entered into the Jewish world. <laughs> yes! Yeah, <not> just <laughs> okay, so I just want to say because... It's very, thank you for bringing that out because that's actually how we think. That we don't always have to have the scripture, but this is my revelation. That's what I, th- I think that is possible. And that's okay. That's also part of the interpretation process. So thank you for bringing that out. Yes? So is there then an application for how you would use silence in your life? Yes. The message I would walk away with is... Can, I should be able to, I have to train myself when circumstances are really bad not to complain but to find the praise. That's what I walk away with that message. That is a very hard thing to do and train about because our first thing is, oh man, God doesn't love me. Mom, my day is really screwed up because X, Y, and Z. God, where were you? Like we blame God for a lot. Even though a lot of human decisions were involved in the day's affairs. And somehow, God was involved in human choice affairs. And that's the whole point of free will. You have a choice what you need to do in your life. And those decisions have consequences. So the consequences is not because God made it that way. It's humans put in their daily life. And that's the whole point of love your neighbor is such a fundamental concept and the basis of the entire word of God because it's very It's a commandment, right? And love is an emotion. So 
God is sort of commanding an emotion. From a Jewish perspective, it's very hard to command an emotion. It's very hard to say, you need to love this person because most of the time it's like, I really don't love this person. It's not you, it, it's, it's me. Okay? <laughs> I, I have, I just, this is not working. This is not working with us. So in our, in our perspective, when God's commanding us to love is from a purpose of action. The way we love is by going ahead and doing something to show, to get to that mode of love. It's doing something for the other that we normally would not be able to do for, we would not think to do for ourselves. We go beyond. It's hard to love someone like yourself because I love me very much. I am awesome, but this guy, not me. It's not me. Yes. Again, I'm going to go back to, do you have a scripture to back that up? And the scripture of the golden calf, but that is not the word silent. There was no silence in that. The word itself doesn't lend me to that interpretation. That's possible as an interpretation, but I can't just borrow from any episode and, and bring it into this particular episode. This Word silence is a very unique word. It's a word that doesn't really appear that much in the Bible. It has a certain translations to it as we see in the Bible because really silence in Hebrew is sheket. Okay? If I was going to go ahead and use a word in Hebrew, it would be sheket. It would not be dom. The word is very unique, thus giving us a way into the interpretation. I said the, the Hebrew is very vital in going ahead and understanding the Bible. Okay? I have one more teaching. I have one more teaching. Okay. We're going to deal with the concept of the synagogue. Um, And the reason why is because you're in a church setting and was borrowed from a synagogue model. Okay? And I think this is where we, unlike, I don't want this to turn into the book of Acts, vice versa, don't don't chase me out. Okay? (laughs) So I want to show you what's revolutionary about the concept of the synagogue. The synagogue is indeed A revolution. Okay, I'm going to show you four four reasons why the synagogue was revolutionary in its time, and we're going to try to find out when the synagogue was introduced, and for what reason, and how, how, and how in the apostolic teachings you actually see an affirmation of this. Okay, ready? And do this in ten minutes. Okay, or something like this. Okay, number one is going to be location, 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 okay? Number two, leadership. Number three is participation. And number four is worship. This is the revolution of the synagogue. Why is location a revolution? Anyone want to take a stab at it? You don't have to go. The temple was the focal point of the Israelite religion. Three years, three times a year, I would have to go up to Jerusalem at least to go ahead and commune with God. Besides whatever things of thanksgiving I have for God or whatever sins and unintentionally that I did throughout my entire life, so on and so forth. So here I am, I take, a, I take a, a group of people and we build something here at the local community level. God is portable. Okay, so location means anywhere. Number two, leadership. Who is the leadership in the temple? The priest and the Levites, but mainly the priest. In a synagogue setting, anybody. 
rabbi can be the person who's giving the message, but as far as leading the conversation, I assume you have a board, right? That's part of your church, right? They're not pastors. No, they're made up of huh? people in the community, right? I'm assuming people who's sitting on the executive board of the church, right, that give him a hard time. Yeah. Not just kidding. <laughs> him a hard time is made up of you, right? Are you priests? Are you Levites? What gives you the right? But that's the revolution. That anyone can participate in the process, okay? You think the church is only your concept. Just want to make sure. It comes from us, okay? Just want to make, okay? Number three is participation. I go to the temple. I give over my animal. Am I involved in any of that process of the animal? No. I'm just, you know, I'm actually in a different room. I'm worse than the, you know, waiting for a doctor. I never see the doctor. The priest takes care of everything. Now look at your own church. Are you involved in the prayers? Very much so. In Judaism, actually, anybody could be involved in leading the congregation. Even a small kid actually is involved in the, in the, in the, in the worship service. Can actually lead the congregation in certain prayers. That's a revolution. Especially in pagan times, right? Forget about the temple in Jerusalem. Just, just imagine in pagan times... I'm just an ordinary guy. I have to do everything through the priest that's there, the priest pagan temple stuff, right? It's a huge thing, the participation that anyone can do it. And number four is worship. Did I do anything prayer-wise? Was the liturgical prayers during for me to part- be, be involved with in the temple? No. And what we're doing here, we worship here. And that particular time to create the synagogue is a huge thing. Now, scholarly... Sources will say that the earliest evidence is the 3rd century BCE. That there is actually mention of a synagogue in the Egyptian writings. Okay? The actual uh, hardcore evidence of physical remains is in Delos, in, in Greece. In the island of Delos is the actual, the, um, the oldest synagogue of, rem- of building remains, okay? So I want to understand from your perspective is why is the synagogue created? Anybody? Why, do, why should we have a synagogue? Why have a church? Huh? Purposes is worship? Okay, corporate worship. Okay? Anybody else? Community. Community. Okay. What other options do they have besides going into exile? But I can tell you that for them, it's just they just have no other way to worship God. Just so you're you're saying that the reason why it was even in existence is based upon circumstance. Okay. We're gonna see if you're right or not. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Anybody else? That's it, corporate worship, community, and circumstance. Okay, so even though there, you know, we love scholarly work, and it helps us understand a little bit about background, but I'm going to give you some Bible verses to look at and actually contemplate about the concept of what a synagogue is. So first, we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 11, 16. Okay, anybody want to take a shot at it? I'm surprised no one has like a tablet or an iPhone. I got it, okay. (laughs) I was like, Steve Jobs was born in the wrong generation. I bring you the iPhone. Here's the Bible. (laughs) Yeah, that'd be great, right? Tablet in in an electronic form, yeah. Uh, Ezekiel 11, 16, anybody? God says he was a sanctuary. Okay, so is that a, now we're dealing with Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel, what was, was very interesting about Ezekiel? He's living at what particular time? Is in exile. He talks about making God a little sanctuary. 
in Hebrew, migdash me'at, which is the word that is used in Hebrew. In that verse, we, are, we interpret as synagogue. Okay? This happens in exile, and therefore, circumstance comes into play. We don't have the temple anymore. We need something to go ahead and bring the community together. And therefore, God is made into the little sanctuary. Does that make sense? So this plays a big part into it. Making sure Jewish life continues. That's one possible thing. Um, then we go to Psalm 26.8. Psalm 26, 8, and also 90, verse 1, okay? There's a word in Hebrew, it's called ma'on, and we're going to ter- interpret that Hebrew word as, as synagogue, but what does the verse say in chapter 26, verse 8? Okay, now this is in times of the Psalms. Psalms can be any, really any time, any type of period. It's not based upon circumstance. It can be even during First Temple times. Or even predate First Temple times. We, unless you know exactly when this was authored. But it's not based upon circumstance. It's based upon that we're praising God. We're getting together and doing that. Is that correct? So the Hebrew word there is ma'on, and some rabbis interpret that to mean the synagogue. Okay, that's another possible way. Then we go to Psalm 74, 8. Anybody want to read? So they were burning the synagogues at that particular point in time. Moadei El is the Hebrew word there, but we see that the buildings were being burnt. Again, not a spe- we don't know the specific period of when this was happening, but it's possible it was during First Temple times. Maybe there was some type of struggle, war going on, and the psalmist is bringing that out. But you see it was sort of part of who they were as a culture, and not based upon circumstance. Okay, Only Ezekiel points out is that there could be a, a, a circumstance, First Temple is destroyed, they're now living in exile. They need community life, rejuvenation of Jewish identity. Okay? Um, we're going to stop over there. There's another one, but we're going to deal with that afterwards. Okay, I just want to deal with, you heard about Ezra and Nehemiah, right? Now, you probably heard of the, the, the story when they were going going back into trying to, you know, into the temple, and they find the law. And like, everyone was really didn't know anything, and over there, they learned about the Feast of Tabernacles, and they're asked to build these huts again. But, you know, because of, of the king beforehand that was so bad and bringing people to idolatrous practices that the entire nation of Israel just forgot everything. Don't remember anything. And Ezra comes in and reminds people to go ahead and start doing things. One of the things that Ezra did was going ahead and institute a public reading of the Bible. In Jewish tradition, we believe that is Mondays and Thursdays. And that the Sabbath reading that we do in the synagogue in the morning was actually instituted by Moses himself. I'm just giving now Jewish stuff, which I can't prove to you in the Bible. This is something part of the oral tradition. Moses instituted the Sabbath reading in the synagogue, Ezra instituted Mondays and Thursdays. The reason is you can't go three days without learning the word of God, just like you can't go out three days without having water, and water is sometimes compared to the word of God. Three days without water is death. Three, wor- three days without the word is spiritual death. Okay? So with that being said, now we have Ezra and Nehemiah, and we're dealing with specific time back then. So the concept of a synagogue back in those days is also a possible theory that it happened during their times as well. Okay. So the question comes up right now is, what's the heart of the synagogue? 
based upon what I just told you now with Ezra and Nehemiah, it is the word of God. Okay? That is the heart of the synagogue. Now the question comes up is, how, what can I find through the apostolic teachings that teach me about the synagogue life? Okay? I'm going to erase this, so if you are planning to take a picture of it, time to do this now. We're good? Okay. Anyway, it's being videoed. You, you can get the DVD. 1995. Three easy payments of... No. And one hard payment. Okay. Now we're going to go through apostolic teachings right now about the synagogue. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're going to go to Acts 13, verses 14 through 15. And what's the purpose of the synagogue according to Acts 13, verses 14 through 15? They went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down and after reading the law and the prophets. Okay, so this is the word of God. Okay, the word itself being read. It's very interesting that it's the law and the prophets. Shouldn't it just be the law? What's the prophets have to do with anything? So I'm just going to give you some background for this verse. At one time, especially during the Maccabean period, the Greeks forbade any public reading of the word of God. And Jews couldn't take out the Torah scrolls and read. Because of that, Jews developed a custom of taking the prophetic writings that corresponded to the Torah portion of that week and read from the prophets. So just to give you sort of a, another background, is that we take the five books of Moses, we divide it up into 54 sections, and each week we read a section of the book, from Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy. At the Feast of Tabernacles, we finish off the entire five books of Moses, and after the Feast of Tabernacles, we begin again with the cycle of the five books of Moses. That particular cycle of reading the five books of Moses on the Sabbath day was forbidden to do during a period in the Greek. We know that through the book of Maccabees. Okay? This is the whole story of Hanukkah, is that we were not allowed to do religious practice we were forbidden to do circumcision and reading of the word and learning the word. And if you learned the word, you would be killed. So in order to go ahead and never forget about what we needed to do, we've developed a custom called reading from the prophets. This is why it says here in Acts that they read from the law and from the prophets. Even though at this particular point in time you were allowed to read the word of God, they still upheld the custom. Can't understand this verse of why they're doing what they're doing without that background behind it, okay? So the important thing about the synagogue, as we know here, is the word itself and reading the word. Next, we go to Matthew chapter, five, chapter 6, verse 5. What's the purpose of the synagogue in this context? We're in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Prayer. Okay? Now, if we go a few verses before 5, we go to 6, 2. What's the purpose of the synagogue? Charity. Okay? Charity goes from the synagogue. Now, we continue to Matthew chapter 10. Now, I know this is not very good for the Pharisees right now in this verse. Okay? But I'm your mountain day Pharisee today. Hi. <laughs> Matthew chapter 10, verse 17 through 18. And also Acts 22, 19. And the purpose for the synagogue was... 
Well, it, you, it's a, it's a con, you, get, you get a flogging after what? Judgment. Judgment. We talked about this today, Pastor Adam, who gets to make the religious decisions and how that's all conducted. Do you do that in a church or not setting for that? I don't... So, how bad the offense is, but all from synagogue, yeah, I know that, right? <laughs> but I just want to show you that religious decisions were made in the synagogue, and sometimes religious decisions are made in a church setting as well, okay? Now, last but not least um, is Luke. I got to squeeze Luke here. Luke f- chapter 4, verse 16 through 22. And Acts 15.21. And what's the purpose? Not reading, not studying, teaching. The sermon comes from here. His job and your job. And the other guy. <laughs> so I just, what? What is that? I see what it's like. <laughs> Five things about the synagogue that you see in your church today. All based upon the model of the synagogue that was revolutionary of its time of making worship portable. But the main focus of the synagogue always comes down to reading the Bible. You can't go ahead and give a message without first reading the Bible. Everything else, the prayer, most people think the synagogue has the purpose of prayer. Prayer came in later. Prayer came in later as a focus, as part of it. But charity, which is the community part of it, judgment is part of the community, which you all said beforehand. All these aspects are part of synagogue life. So you can go ahead and actually look at the apostolic teachings and actually see the very essence of how uh, biblical life was supposed to be, go ahead and be conducted in, in, in the community. Any questions on this? Teaching of the word of God was only in the synagogue. Synagogue for us was, if anything, saved the Jewish people. It was nothing more than the synagogue is about, is about really saving the Jewish people because it became, gave a sense of identity and relationship because of the revolutionary idea that I can be part of the process. And it's a huge concept, especially at that time when pagans, pagan culture was so saturated about there was an elite class And I had nothing to do with it unless I was born into it. Okay? There was never such thing as sacrifice in a synagogue. Did did I write sacrifice up here? Right. There was no such thing as sacrifice in a synagogue. Purpose of synagogue was studying the word of God. Teaching of, the, teaching of the word of God always took place in the synagogue set, setting. That's why I'm trying to point out that the word of God is the entire focus of synagogue life because that's how you get your instructions and how to live your life. Yes? So, so this was the big question that we asked beforehand. What was the per- how did the synagogue come into being? Was it always there? And we have verses that we can back that up that it was always there. Or it was because of circumstance, like we see in Ezekiel, that because temple life was now gone, now I needed something to help me get through with it. Especially after Second Temple life, the Second Temple was destroyed, synagogue life became the primary way of functioning. And it's also the way that that the, the early Christians became who they are. They went, first of all, in the book of Acts, they're always going to synagogue. I mean, I know sometimes it doesn't end well, but they always went to synagogue, <laughs> right? The synagogue played a very vital life, but there was a point. And there's only one instance in the book of Acts that they didn't actually go to a building. 
They were actually praying at the water because I don't know why, but it, the book of Acts brings that. I forgot the chapter and verse right now. But that's the whole point. It came from this revolution. Just at one point, that one thing, it's when someone first told me that their, their whole purpose in life was to plant churches, I was like, what is that? What does it mean to plant churches? Do you have seeds you put in the ground? <laughs> I don't know what that means, planting churches. And it was like this concept I never heard before because we don't plant synagogues. Different mindset. It's because the purpose of going ahead and planting a church is to go ahead and bring people to Jesus, right? That's the whole purpose of doing it. Well, we're, we lost our charismatic nature after the Second Temple period. We were just basically trying to retain who we are, so synagogue became all about about life as Jews, living as Jews. We weren't going out and converting people at that particular point in time after the Second Temple period. We weren't able to do that. So when we, when we hear a concept of planting churches, it's very foreign in our mind. What's, what does that mean? So just pointing out like sort of a communication thing. Yes. You had a question? Right about, yeah. In the Tanakh, it has different variations of the word synagogue. It could be Migdash Ma'ach, it could be Ma'on, Ma'ode'el. It doesn't have, a, synagogue is a Greek word. I want to make that very clear. Synagogue is not a Hebrew word. And it means an assembly getting together. No, build the temple there specifically means build the tabernacle. Okay, that's over there when it says that, that's actually what it means to build actually a temple or to build that. That means to, when it actually says that, it doesn't mean synagogue. There are other words to describe synagogue, and that's the ones that we went through right now. Yeah. Oh, okay. If that's the case, then yeah. So. No, I don't know. Okay, fine. Weren't? Okay. Ask a Jew anything you were afraid to now you can ask, plus whatever you want on the teaching right now. Go ahead. So, uh, the last chapter, how is sin atoned for? Excellent question. There you go. So, how is sin atoned for if there's no temple? So, okay. So, we have to go back to um, the concept of sin. Okay? You Christi Christians believe, and I'm going with mainstream doctrine, okay? Mainstream doctrine is the belief in original sin. This original sin affected the DNA, spiritual DNA of my soul that's always in a state of sin. And the way to get out of that is through the eternal blood of Jesus Christ. Correct? So, it, pastor is here? Okay. <laughs> pastor is here. So, I'm looking for your voice. I just want to make sure I'm Okay. Okay, so therefore there is this concept of original sin, and that sin affects me forever, that fall. Jews don't believe in original sin. We believe in original consequence. Consequence. We got, they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden because of what they did. But the sin that they committed was not a spirit, did not affect my soul spiritually. I want to make that very clear. Okay, this is the difference between Judaism and Christianity. Okay? What about if you lie today? No, it doesn't mean I don't have a propensity to sin. Okay, again, we have to go back. Original sin affecting me forever, unless, and unless I take Jesus into my life, and that eternal blood is an eternal atonement, works behind the concept of original sin. Okay? The question of whether you sin after you accept Jesus into your life is an eternal debate within Christianity whether or not if you sin after you accept Jesus, is that a sin that you need to atone for or does the blood of a Jesus continually atone for the sins in a continual state? That's not for me to answer, okay? You have a pastor over here. He can do that for you, okay? I <laughs> okay? Just to let you know, liturgically, we every morning wake up and we say, I thank you, living eternal king, for giving me back my soul immersed in impurity. Great is your faithfulness. This is a, a reaction to original sin and saying that my soul is spiritually defected forever unless I accept Jesus in my life. 
I believe my soul is completely pure, and it has, you may, I'm letting you know you disagree with this. You don't, there's nothing, this is, a, this is one of the things that separates Judaism and Christianity. So therefore, sacrifice for sin and during temple times was only for a specific type of sin. The sin for accidental sins. I did something accidentally, and therefore I would bring a, a uh, sacrifice. If I did something intentionally, there were no sacrifices for that. If I did something that was really beyond my circumstance, like I didn't, you know, I really didn't think this was going to harm the person at all. Really, this is like really unintentional sin. There's no sacrifices for that. Sacrifices were for accidental sins. I want to make that very clear. Okay, and the purpose for that was, is to sort of, the purpose of a sacrifice was to say, listen, you did something wrong, that really should be you. This should teach you a lesson in, in readjusting your life for God. Okay, and it came in during a period of time. Sacrifices were introduced once the golden calf happened. And Jews weren't ready to go ahead and accept God on God's terms. They needed this intermediary thing and to get through with it. And God said, okay, if you want the sacrificial system, sacrificial system I'm going to give it to you. And there's going to be nuances for everything. But again, we go back to only accidental sins for that. This is where Judaism and Christianity are not going to agree, but that's fine. But I just want you to understand the basis for where, where Christians come from the doctrine and how it leads up to there and where Jews come from the doctrine. We believe we're born in a state of neutrality. And our whole purpose is to get back to the Garden of Eden by going ahead and doing God's will here on earth. I am not here to be perfect in front of God because God gave me free choice and therefore he knows I'm going to once in a while, screw up, but therefore I ask God in his infinite grace and compassion to forgive me for what I've done today. We've always asked God for forgiveness at least three times a day in our prayers. And we invoke the 13 attributes of God. God, God, you are merciful, compassionate, righteous, slow to anger. Okay? Yes, I know the whole concept of works and, you know, works and faith, but I know you believe in justification of faith and, and acts as an affirmation of that faith. At least that's the most, most, most of the doctrine. But works is about not a savings bank account where I, at the end of my life I say, hey God, I'm going to make a withdrawal. Here are all my commandments I did. Psh, show me to the pearly gates. That's not the purpose of why we do what we do. We do it because God told us. And at the end of the day, I really don't know if I'm getting in. I can only rely on God's grace. That is it. If I get in because of God's grace, because I am not perfect, I do things that are wrong. But all I can do is try my best for today and be an active agent in God's kingdom here on earth to do the will of God. Is that helpful? Okay, yes. No, no. Uh, so, so, okay, and your, your question is, do Jews believe in the Messiah? That's number one. Number two, uh, was Jesus another, another Messiah in the history of Messiahs in, Jew, in the Jewish, relig in Jewish history? All right, those are your two questions. I want to make sure that's it. Was there a third one? No, that's it. Okay, so we do believe in Messiah. Of course, uh, Messiah is supposed to usher in peace into the world, okay? And everyone will, after that happens, everyone will acknowledge who God is. Uh, he's from the house of David. Every single generation, there's a potential for someone to be the Messiah. The question is, are we ready to bring, are we ready for Messiah? Are we doing what we can do to make it, uh, uh, for Messiah to come in? Are we doing that? But we believe he's a human being. And if that human being was assigned to be a, si a Messiah and he didn't fulfill that role and he died, that's it. 
Could it be that Jesus was a Messiah at the particular point of time in the, towards the end of the Second Temple period for a particular sect of Jews? Yeah, 100%. Could be. But I just want to make the differentiations between Messiah and God. Okay, we don't put those both doctrines in that Messiah is God. We believe Messiah is a completely human being without any divinity whatsoever. Okay, because when you say Messiah, you mean more than just Messiah. You mean Jesus is Lord and Savior when you're putting that in. So I just want to say, for us, it's a separation. God is God. Messiah, has a, he's an agent for God to usher in a particular period. He's more than a prophet. He doesn't have to be a prophet. He's more than a prophet. He has a specific mission. His mission is to usher in the ultimate peace, whatever that looks like. Yes, but the thing is, is that at that particular point in time, if Messiah does come, we all resurrect anyway. We believe in the concept of resurrection. Okay, go with that one. Okay. <laughs> so, so the, the thing is, is that uh, we don't believe that Messiah will be from, uh, from a virgin. Okay, that is a Christian doctrine. Uh, we believe the person, that Messiah is born from a regular intimate act between a man and a woman. Um, we do have a different take on that verse as far as it doesn't mean virginity or doesn't mean young and not necessarily mean virgin. But that, again, that becomes something that you should ask pastor about. But I'm just giving you, just giving you the Jewish take on things. It's not for me to answer for Christianity, okay? And I just want to make, make that thing. And, and again, I'm here. I, I just want to make this clear. I'm not here to debate. I'm just letting you know what Jews think about the idea. And the Isaiah suffering servant, suffering servant for us is the Jewish people, okay? We've went through it all. Uh, we, the difference, I would have to say, the ultimate difference between Jew, Judaism and Christianity is incarnation with a capital I. This goes back to the suffering servant concept. We believe that God is incarnate in the body of Israel. He doesn't full, fully subsume himself into the body of Israel. He's just part of the body of Israel. And when, we're, when he's there, we are, since we're elected to do what we need to do, and we don't do that, or the world is not there to acknowledge who God is, we get the slap. We, and we, that's what's happened in Jewish history. I understand from your perspective that Christians would go ahead and look at it as that being Jesus. 100%, I understand that. From a Jewish take of things, we believe it's us as the elected. Um, so I just want to make sure. Did I answer everything? Yep. Okay. Wait, did, before I get to you, there was that person in the back. I, you asked a question. I just want to get someone who didn't ask yet. Is it, okay, so, okay, so what happens at the, at the end of the day? So I just want to listen, Romans 11, let's just go with, deal with Romans 11 for a second, okay? So if you believe you've been adopted or grafted into this covenant of ours, hi, how are you? It's nice to meet you, okay? If you believe I've been replaced, hope you invite me again. Um, but if you we are covenantal partners, there is a mystery at the end of what Romans 11 says. Somehow, God will make all this work out. I leave that to God, okay? Is it possible that somehow, you know, Christians will believe that we will accept Jesus? That's fine. I believe that you'll become an Orthodox Jew. <laughs> and, I, and I mean that very seriously, by the way. I'm not, and I, don't, and I mean that because if you believe you have the most perfect revelation, then I understand why you're sharing that most perfect revelation and what you believe is what you believe. I'm an Orthodox Jew because I believe I have the most perfect revelation too. Okay? And therefore, I have no problem saying very, very confidently, I would want you to go ahead and become an Orthodox Jew. My relationship with you is not based upon that you should go ahead and convert to my way of life. I believe that your way of life is salvific for you, and I will be sipping martinis with you in heaven if you believe that you have alcoholic beverages in heaven. Okay? <laughs> if not, then we'll sip Cokes. That's fine. <laughs> so the thing is, but, the, the, but that's sort of the point of having the conversation of what we believe in right now is that I don't know. I don't know. 
and I shouldn't have all the answers. I'm a finite human being. But this is, but what I wish to see in this relationship is that we both see ourselves living within the covenantal expression of what God wants from us. And that we do this together, respecting our core theological doctrines. If I have any hope of, of this. Because I do believe this is the right time and age for making this happen. That finally the church and synagogue can sit side by side, respecting each other, while saying at the end, yes, I believe in Jesus. He's done so much for my life. And I want this, you to have this too. And I can respect that. That's fine. But I, to me, what's more important is the fellowship that we're doing right now. And let God be God. You can't make me do anything anyway. If you're really looking at it from a pure Christian perspective, if it's my encounter, it's my encounter. You can show me. You can relate your experience to me. Similar to what I can relate my experience to you. Yes. Membership has, has its privileges. <laughs> so, so I will tell you this. This is the, uh, a different approach to conversion. We believe in discipleship first, conversion afterwards. You should always know what you're getting yourself into from our perspective. Because it does entail a certain lifestyle that's more demanding than it is in Christianity, uh, there is more stuff related as far as commandment life is concerned. Listen, uh, you know, you enjoy bacon. Enjoy Paul's dispensation on that. That's really good for you. I live vicariously through you. No. Uh, but I'm just saying that, you know, I won't be able to eat certain things. I have to, you know, so there's a concept of sacredness of time. My 24-hour period for Shabbat I'm not dealing with the world. I'm not dealing with email. I'm not driving anywhere. I'm dealing with specifically to God, my family, and the community without any distractions. That's the purpose of my Shabbat. So there's going to be a lifestyle, but you have to be educated in this beforehand because simply just going ahead and saying, I'm in, and then you find out, oh, really? Uh, it's like, you know what it's like? It's creating an email account, and you're supposed to read all the fine print, of, you know, but we don't do that. We just go to the blue button and say yes. We're afraid of that, of just going ahead and clicking the blue button and going in yes. So therefore, our concept is discipleship first and conversion afterwards. And if you're really to make that commitment, we, we welcome you with open arms. We want you to know what you're getting yourself into. So the process is education. Understand what you're going through. Ultimately, you're going into what you would call baptism, which is our ritual mikvah. You go, you dip yourself in totally, full dunk, no clothes whatsoever. Very serious. There's a, you have to, and uh, if you're a male, you get circumcised. So it's preferably that you do this at eight days instead of <laughs> 85. <laughs> uh, and then living out that biblical lifestyle. And you want to live according to that will of God. And that's the, where a motivation for us is a key thing. And we want to make sure you have the right motivation. And you didn't get caught up. In, in something. No. Book of Revelation, I've studied it. I'm still, I, I don't understand it. It's, and I don't mean to make fun of it. I really don't. It's very hard as a Jew to understand the book of Revelation in, in, in its entirety. But we don't have a 144,000 number concept at all in Jewish thought. Um, and we, don't, and we, we say that people will acknowledge who God is. You don't necessarily have to be an Orthodox Jew to do that. You can be someone who who goes ahead and accepts God, God through faith like Abraham, that's fine. We're okay with that as long as you acknowledge who God is and live, live a biblical lifestyle. Yes? Okay. I, I'm not an atheist. I just want to... I'm not an atheist. There are Jews who are, are an atheist. Yes, there are also people who are former Christians that are, are an atheist as well or have a different spin on God. So the thing is, is that uh, there's a choice out there. 
Uh, I don't take away, I just want, I'm not sure where you're going with the question, so I just want to make it, I don't take any away anybody's Jewishness, okay? I don't take away anybody's Jewishness, but if you are going ahead and, and not acknowledging God, then you don't get the privileges of membership because you actively took yourself out of what we believe mainstream Judaism is defined as a God-centered religion. I believe in God. I am, I am not afraid to say that. I love God, and God demands things of me. If you don't want to follow it, that's your choice. That's between you and God. But membership means being active in God's plan. And it's just not based upon a concept of tikkun olam, which is repairing the world, because that's only half of the verse. It's repairing the world to bring the kingdom of God here. It's God-centered. That's my whole reason of living. Okay? Okay, so the so okay, so here. I will then throw it a different way. Someone accepts Jesus in their life. The next day they decide not to, you know, what, you know, that was a big mistake. So do you take away that conversion or not? Or do you say that person is an error? And we hopefully one day that person will recognize his or her misdeed and get back. Correct? So we do have a belief that if you're born Jewish, you're that's a privilege. You're in that you're in that that, that's the royal family. That's who we are. But if you have been actively getting yourself out of it by believing whatever, then you are a Jew in error. And hopefully one day you will recognize the errors of your ways and you will return back. So I'm not going to take away Jewishness. I'm not the judge. God is the judge of that. But that person is in error, but doesn't get the privileges of being part of the, you know, part of the, the mainstream. And that's the way I would look at it. Okay? Yes. Okay, so that's an interesting question that you're using Ezekiel 37 to explain what I do. I don't do it based upon Ezekiel 37, and we don't look at Ezekiel 37 the same way. And that's a different discussion. I do what I do because somehow I'm letting you know I'm, God is leading me in this, in the sacred calling. It's very simple. I do that because some reason when I tried to get out of it, God brought me back into it. It's it's the it's the Godfather number three. I every time I get out, they pull me back in. Uh, so so um, so for me, this is a sacred calling. It's not getting the marriage of the two sticks concept. Well, I'm, I'm not I, that you're aware of. Oh that oh <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Touche. <laughs> I don't know. I'm doing it because God has led me to do it. That, that's it. And it's not ba- for me, it's more, more based upon uh, a Jonah concept. Uh, God asked Jonah to go ahead and go to the enemy of Israel. First time in history, in sacred history, and ask them to repent. And Jonah says, uh, I'm not having any of this and runs away. And he can't run away from his destiny, really. And at the end, he does what God wants, and the people repent. I don't want to act like Jonah's initial reaction. For me, the, I have never thought there would be a Christian like the Christians I, I experienced throughout my 13 years in doing this, that are willing to stand with us. We always felt we were alone. I don't feel we're alone anymore. And indeed, many of you are standing in the gap. This is not about agreeing to the politics of Israel or not. It's simply based upon faith that you are feeling that you're grafted into my covenant and you want to walk this line and understand the mystery of it all. So I don't want, when God says to me, you know, you, to do this, I had a choice of running away. Sometimes I felt I wanted to. But if I'm really adhering to what God wants, I have to go along with the program. I don't want to sound Calvinistic, but I don't, this is my destiny. Oops, Sorry. <laughs> yes. Wow. 
Wow, we're getting very personal. <laughs> um, yes, my wife had definitely had, definitely had issues because she never dealt with Christians. She came from Israel. And definitely it was a, you know, a wake-up call because, again, when she married me, I wasn't dealing with you know, the whole Jewish-Christian portfolio. I was actually in politics back then. So this is a new thing for her. I mean, one of, the, one of the times, again, I speak to many pastors at home, and I'm speaking about theology, and, of course, Jesus always comes up in a conversation, so I'm saying Jesus, and all she hears is um, Jesus. And like she said to me after a phone call, I heard more Jesus in a phone call from you today than I heard in my entire life. <laughs> it's an adjustment. It's not easy, you know, and I, and, but I'm grateful that my wife allows me to do this, even though she doesn't completely understand what this is all about. So I am honored that she allows me to be here today. And, you know, again, she's with three, three kids at home, and it's very hard for her. So I'm very honored that she allows me to do what I want to do in this, and she sees the, the, the significance of it, even though maybe she doesn't understand all the intricacies of it. Um, okay, wow. Just, yeah. Maybe just one more, one more. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm not going to win an Alumni Year Award for my yeshiva. <laughs> it's very important to know that. Um, so the answer to that is, yeah, um, many, many people from the Orthodox community are finally understanding what we're doing and see the significance of it. I, it but it was a very lonely place to be uh, at the beginning six years ago in creating the first Orthodox Jewish Center. We went through a very bad PR nightmare and literally the doors of my institution was about to close because of what we were doing but again God's hand I believe is on this and therefore it allows us to be and more and more Jews are coming out from the woodwork and seeing the significance of it when I go to listen 13 years ago when I went to a night to celebrate Israel I was the only Jew in the congregation more and more I see more Jews coming out and being part of that process when Christians are inviting them to come and do something like this. And also Jews are inviting Christians to be part of, of their celebratory events and stuff like that. So I think what you're seeing right now is it is a God moment. I can't explain why there are these downloads of uh, happening to Christians and supporting Israel. I went to South Korea. 1,500 people came out on the steps of City Hall. I was in Nairobi. Af Nairobi. 2,000 Africans. They don't know who a Jew is. They don't never seen Israel before. I can't explain it. But there's a download happening. So I have to acknowledge it and be part of it. And that, that's what I see. I just want to answer your question with the Garden of Eden so I didn't forget what you were saying. Um, I'm, as far as the denial of knowledge, the issue wasn't the denial of uh, knowledge. The issue is whether or not Adam would go ahead whether the first human beings, whether or not they will, will obey God, okay, and not peek behind the closed door. Again, I would go back and just say that the purpose of what God was trying to demonstrate there is I gave you an order. You are supposed to obey that order. I don't, and that's much of a consequence. And, and, and that God did give an ability for Adam to repent when he said to him, where are you? He didn't throw him out of the garden right away. He asked, he asked, where are you? Not like hide and seek type of concept. Where are you spiritually with me? And instead, Adam bl did the blame game, which is often what we do. Not me. He, he was hiding, not hiding not behind any type of thing, hiding behind an excuse. That it was not me that you caught me in the cookie jar. It's because of her. And she says it's because of the snake. So it's all about... Abuse, excuse, I'm sorry, it's about abuse, accuse, and excuse. Well, actually, pride is very important. Pride is very important. Because it's, it's like, you know, it's like, 
Okay, we can discuss that afterwards. I just wanted to. Uh, we we could talk about it afterwards. I just want uh, so I I just want to give you my sort of one, on one leg answer for that. Okay. You have a good pastor. Okay. <laughs> So before, before uh, we conclude, I just want to say thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, this is my second Methodist congregation I've spoken in 13 years. I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity for doing this. Um, again, I, can't, I just want to make sure if I offended you in any way, it wasn't the intention. The purpose of this really was to create the relationship and, and just try to understand one another. Uh, please... The only favor I ask of you, if you do, are you are, if you're on Facebook, is just to like us. <laughs> That's the only thing I'm asking you, if you do, is just to please like us on Facebook, CJCUC. Uh, you can get the details from, from Pastor. Um, really, thank you, really, for doing this. Uh, you are very courageous. There are not many people in your position that allowed me to come up on the pulpit and do this and say, well, thank you, from really deepest recesses of my heart for doing this. Blessings to everybody, but remember, if you are catching the vision, I expect many of you to come next year to Israel. <laughs>